Mr. Burns is so old, he's been around since before the dinosaurs. And that's not a joke, by the way. He's literally said as much. Enter place of birth. Pangea. Piecing together his convoluted history into one cohesive timeline is a mammoth task. You're fired! So you can understand why I've been putting this video off, not to mention that The Real Gyms has already done a fantastic video on Mr. Burns. But I've received so many comments, literally hundreds of them, asking me to do his history, and I can't put it off any longer. So this one is for you guys. But to help me out, I've asked the expertise of Zach from ZZ's World. Over on his awesome channel, he analyzes the lives of horror characters from Pennywise to Michael Myers. So if he can make sense of those messed up timelines, I'm sure he's the perfect person to help me sort out Mr. Burns' evil, evil life. Excellent. Thanks, Lydia. I have talked about some of the most evil characters in history over on my channel, but I don't know if any of them compare to the wickedest of Mr. Burns. So let's start by taking it back to the very beginning. Trying to figure out Mr. Burns' age is trickier than solving Professor Provolone's Picto puzzle. Charles Burns' exact birth year is hard to pin down thanks to the sliding timeline of the series. For anyone as old as Burns, it's probably a bit harder to keep track of exact dates. Burns' age has been explicitly mentioned to be 81, 89, and 104. His exact age has jumped around over the years, with Burns even implying his birthplace was the prehistoric supercontinent Pangaea. What is certain is that he's at least been said to be younger than 108, as that was the age of Cornelius Chapman when he was declared spring Field's oldest citizen in season 13 instead of Burns. With the relative age and general frame of reference likely placed him as a child in the late 19th century, growing up at the dawn of the 20th century. Long before he'd become Mr. Burns, Charles was just a little boy with a teddy bear called Bobo as his best friend. And for someone who'd grew up to inspire terrifying nursery rhymes or resemble the literal crib keeper, he was a surprisingly innocent child. Season 5's Rosebud revealed Burns initially growing up in a relatively humble home with his parents Clifford and Daphne but he was later taken in by his rich grandfather, later confirmed to be Wainwright, a former slave owner appearing in the Civil War era episode, The Color Yellow. Thanks to his grandfather's Atomil, the boy grew up to be a rich, pampered, and overall awful, awful kid. Under Wainwright's guardianship, Charles became a special kind of cruel, the kind who'd break a worker's legs just for a bit of a laugh. <laughs> Even his seemingly wholesome parents had a hint of evil in their genes too. Like when his father revealed some kind of extreme views on parenting by burning down a comic book store to teach his son a lesson. Why did you have to lock us in? Teach my son a lesson. And his one wish for Christmas as a child was a smile from his parents. A simple wish that never came true. It's from here you can start to see how this spoiled and cold childhood could shape him to be the man we know of today. Another particularly traumatic childhood memory was performing in a peewee pageant, and while he was dancing his little socks off, his pants came off instead and mooned the entire crowd. Monty was the youngest of 11 siblings, well, 12 if you count George Burns. Bum, 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 bum. Oh, the sun shines bright on my old Kentucky home. Bum, 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 bum. And all of them died under mysterious circumstances. He ate another poisoned potato. Spontaneous combustion fell down a well. Potato, potato. Meaning that when the time came, all of his family's wealth would go to him. Funny how that works out. Burns' relationship with his mother seemingly deteriorated after Daphne's extramarital affair with former United States President William Howard Taft. It's even suggested that Burns never really forgave his mother for this transgression, which considering the lows he'd discover over the years is really saying something. On his family's prestige, Burns was able to reach the Ivy League and attended Yale University as one of the many parallels drawn between his character and Charles Foster Kane from the classic movie Citizen Kane. 
Like Cain, Burns was well positioned to turn his inheritance into an even vaster fortune as a businessman, quickly becoming a major success. The Charles M. Burns of this era was also a bit of a ladies' man, wooing women across the world. While in Paris, he proposed to his cousin, Lila, she had only one request, set aside five minutes a day to think of others. But Burns was unable to be selfless for that long. He found love with another woman named Gertrude, and the two got engaged. But he was so busy with work, he missed their wedding, their honeymoon, and their divorce. It was also in this period Burns reunited with his unrequited college love, Minzy Bancroft, as revealed in season 8's Burns Baby Burns. But he was more interested in her daughter, Lily, because Burns has never exactly been what you'd describe as nice. Lily ended up giving birth to a boy who was given up for adoption. We'll get back to that son later though. Burns eventually outlived his grandfather and seemingly inherited his wealth, using it to invest in his own empire. So much so, he was a pretty big deal in town. And Mr. Burns in the Roaring Twenties could partay. His shindigs were so epic, they remembered a full century later. Burns eventually reached the level of success where he fully stopped paying attention to the world around him and didn't even realize when it was the great stock market crash in 1929. But this ignorance didn't let him escape the events of World War II. Although he's been implied to do some business with the Axis powers, Burns found himself eventually a part of the United States Army. He was assigned to the front lines under the command of Abraham Simpson, who even saved Mr. Burns' life. After the war, Monty returned to America and continued to be a major financial powerhouse. His wealth meant that he was selected by President Harry Truman to personally deliver a trillion dollars worth of aid to war-torn Europe. It went as well as you'd expect, and he decided to keep all the money to himself. Wow, that must be worth a fortune. Burns' interest turned further towards science following the war, with Burns investing at the labs at Springfield University towards developing germ warfare weapons, at least until Abraham's wife Mona helped to destroy them. My precious germs, they never harmed a soul, they never even had a tent. He declared revenge on her, causing her to leave little Homer and go into hiding. With the help of Wayland Smithers Sr., Burns eventually amassed his power around the Springfield nuclear power plant. Wayland Sr. seemed to be one of the few men that Burns ever truly considered a friend and made sure to care for Wayland's son when he perished, protecting the town from a potential meltdown. But this didn't stop Burns from supposedly killing plenty of people over the years and hiding their bodies, along with Wayland Sr. in a local quarry. The power plant only helped further separate Burns from any repercussions for his crimes, with his wealth and importance to the town keeping him in a state of power among the authorities, even letting him literally by justice. It pays to be super rich, it turns out. This would be a great place to put an ad. One of the only ties to the regular world that Burns maintained was through his fandom of professional wrestling, especially the despicable heel, glamorous Godfrey, unaware that Godfrey was actually his old wartime superior, Abe Simpson. I find it funny that he takes an interest in something as physical as pro wrestling, when even a slight breeze could be enough to do him in. Oh no, no, in, in fact, even a slight breeze could- Indestructible. Burns always found ways to try to bolster his holdings, whether it be through purchasing early stocks in Apple or claiming the rights to the song White Christmas. But while his personal wealth may have remained consistent, his actual holdings were frequently in flux, and eventually even in downfall. However, every time his fortune seems to be in freefall, Burns always finds a way back up. Much of The Simpsons operates on a sliding timescale. Despite the decades of the episode, the series' main cast hasn't notably changed within the world of Springfield. As a result, Mr. Burns hasn't obviously aged since his initial very, 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 very old status when the show began. Being as old as Mr. Burns is, everyone he knows is pretty much, well, dead. His closest confidant being his assistant Smithers, who is utterly and madly in love with him. Hello, Smithers. You're quite good at turning me on. Um. But Burns seems pretty much oblivious to his affections, although I personally believe that Burns is aware of his crush, but simply chooses to ignore it. I hope you understand it was merely a sign of my respect. Yes, yes, of course. 
Either way, the two of them have a pretty codependent relationship. Smithers! With Smithers pretty much doing anything and everything for his boss, including bathing him, but it's something they's only too happy to oblige. And although Burns wouldn't like to admit it, he does love Smithers, just not in the romantic way that Smithers wants. Aside from Waylon Smithers, Burns has also found himself tied to the Simpsons family. Homer works for him at the nuclear power plant, he briefly fell in love with his wife Marge, he named Bart his heir, he worked with Lisa to get his wealth back, and Maggie even shot him. One other constant in Mr. Burns' life is his rivalry with Grandpa Abe, from attempting to make off with the flying hellfish treasure, to battling over the ladies. Oh yeah, remember that fling that Mr. Burns had with Lily all those years ago? Well, it turns out they had a child together called Larry, who was put up for adoption after his mother was confined to a convent. Loudmouth Larry is now all grown up and pedals tacky souvenirs in the middle of nowhere. When a train heading for Springfield stops in its tracks, Larry notices Burns through the window and realises that he's his long lost father, and so he hitches a ride with the Simpsons. Later on, he knocks on Monty's door and introduces himself. Despite being initially pleased at the meeting with his estranged son, their happiness quickly turned to disappointment, as Larry turned out to be the complete opposite of Monty. <sighs> A total lack of refinement. But in order to win his father's approval, he and his best bud Homer stage a fake kidnapping. But after this is foiled, Larry asks his dad to love him for who he is. Something that Burns just couldn't do. Oh no, I can't do it, it's just not me. But do not be fooled, this old dog has a few more tricks yet, embarking on numerous campaigns to broaden his impressive repertoire of accomplishments. This includes finding the Loch Ness Monster, becoming the superhero through Batman, and even stealing Christmas. The man who blocked out our son ran over a local boy and stole Christmas from 1981 to 1985? He's procured some of the world's greatest treasures along with an impressive and horrifying collection of speciality clothes made from animals. I really like the vest. I gathered you. Proving himself to be one of the most driven, spontaneous, and hell, even interesting characters out of the entire lot. Excellent. Burns is largely focused on amassing more wealth, spreading his influence through Springfield and generally being the town's most feared man. It's even implied that his hatred for the rest of Springfield is what keeps him alive. Thank you, Springfield, for giving me the secret to eternal life. Hate! You're welcome. Yes, Burns' depravity knows no bounds. He once blocked out the sun to increase its reliance on the nuclear power plant and refused to give the citizens extra energy when enclosed in a giant dome. The one evil Mr. Burns may never conquer is death. But he's damn well tried with experimental medical advancements that has prolonged his life, even if they leave him feeling a little funny. I bring you love. It's bringing love, don't let it get away. Break his leg. Burns is even expected to live on for a few decades more, at least. He appears briefly in future episodes where he hasn't changed much in the handful of years past the present day. He also apparently stole Christmas. Again. Yeah, I miss Christmas. But Burns' wicked ways would soon come back to bite him. In Lisa's wedding, it's revealed that he was stabbed 17 times in the back and frozen in a cryogenic chamber until Frank and his nerds could find the cure. Groening sure does love his applied cryogenics. He eventually was cured, but he was thought out a little too soon. There you go. What's next for Mr. Burns? Well, only time will tell, and so far it suggests that things are about to get weird for Springfield. A potential endgame for Burns is even hinted to extend into the distant future, with Burns seemingly surviving the end of the world thanks to a robot body in what I'm sure won't be anyone's new waking nightmare. But at least, even at the end of the world, he'll always have his best friend, Bobo. Also, Smithers is there too as a robot dog, because why wouldn't he be? 
And my golly, that completes the life of Mr. Charles Montgomery Burns. A huge thank you to Zach for helping me out with this video. If you like my timelines, then you'll love his content. So please go and subscribe to him. The link for his channel is down in the description below.